Good afternoon and welcome to this time of remembrance of the Nixinich disaster which began 70 years ago tomorrow on the 7th of September. The service will follow uh, fairly closely the lines of the service which will take place at 1pm on Sunday the 6th of September at the Nixinich Memorial. That service at the memorial is organised by the New Covenant Ornish Lodge, who have been very faithful in organising memorial services each year. We come to remember the Nuxinach Castle Colliery disaster and the people whose lives it took and the people whose lives it affected. Let us pray. Lord be with us. May our time of remembering honour those whose lives were lost or changed forever. Make us ever more committed to our community here in Newcomnock and draw us closer to you, our God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Nukshinach is an experience that most of us can only imagine, as over 120 mine men were trapped underground in the darkness, with water and mud coming in, and dangerous gases all around them as well. These words from the Bible pick up at least some of the feelings the people there may have had. Some of the feelings of anyone in a situation where they feel trapped, in danger, overwhelmed. So in the Bible we read, this is what the Lord says, Don't be afraid, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep you away. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. You are pressured, precious and honoured in my sight. I love you. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. The Bible is full of stories. There are poems and other things too, but mainly stories, and not all of them true. Jesus, as we know, made up stories to teach people different things. But most of the stories in the Bible are true. And these true stories have shaped the life and character and direction of the nation of Israel and the church. New Covenant 2 is full of stories. Not all of them are true, but many are. And these stories also shape the life and character of our community in New Cumnock. And they have a direct, an influence in the direction that it takes, the choices that it makes. Like the story told today, the Nuxinach story, that Bobby will share with us a bit later. When I was eight or nine, one of my friends whose dad worked at the Killach told me about a film he said we should watch. It was called The Brave Don't Cry. There was too much in the film for a nine-year-old to take in, but I remember the telephone working. That amazed me. I remember the cleverness and courage of the men that inspired me. I heard about New Cumnock, which I thought was maybe just to the left of the planet Mars. I would often, as I grew up, remember the story and be inspired by it all over again. I'm a bit older than nine now. I know, for example, that New Cumnock is actually just to the right of the planet Mars. And the more I've learned about Nuxinach, the more inspired 
and amazed and humbled I've become. But if Nakshinach and its many stories has influenced New Cumnock since those September days in 1950, you would have to say too that New Cumnock influenced the responses of the men and women and families of the day. That courage and common sense, selflessness and support did not suddenly come out of a clear blue sky when disaster struck. But stories from of old, lives lived, values handed down. Nakshinich influenced and still influences New Cumnock. But New Cumnock, I believe, played its part in how people dealt with the tragedy. And was God silent in all of this storytelling? Where was his story? It was right in the middle of it all, told or rather sung by John Robertson, very quietly, with a lot of persuasion at first, but in the end very powerfully. As John's voice grew stronger, others joined in with the chorus, and even the people outside could hear. What a great picture of the words we read earlier. I will be with you. God doesn't promise to take us away from difficult situations, fire, flood, storms. But in these situations of tragedy and despair, we have these words of rock-solid hope. I am with you. A promise, not always for the well-being of our bodies, but always always for the safety of our souls. What an encouragement it must have been to hear the story of the old rugged cross sung in the depths of that collapsed mine and on the surface. Our God finds ways. Yes, sometimes miraculous ways to reach and to rescue us. And when that, for whatever reason, is not to be, he doesn't turn on his heel and leave. He stays with us. That's our hope and reassurance when we think back to those September days 70 years ago. That whether, that with the 13 who tragically would lose their lives, or the 116 miraculously saved. God was with them all. Because of the true story of the one who gave his life for us on a hell far away, so that we, trusting in him, can have somebody to cling to in life, through death, to the life to come. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for all the human stories of courage, determination, ingenuity, hard work that have been told about Nuxenach. Help us to tell and retell them for our encouragement and guidance. We thank you too that in the darkest, most hopeless of places, your story was told bringing faith and hope through trust in your death and resurrection for us, for this life and the next. Comfort those who still grieve the loss of a family member, a loss of so many friends and colleagues. Thank you for the courage, wisdom, 
selfless actions of those who volunteered to help. Be with us now as we hear again the story of Nakshenach. We pray in Jesus' name. And now Bobby will tell us that story. We're going to use the slides and the talk that he gave at Tea in the Hall yesterday, which is a fine narration of the Nakshenach disaster and rescue. Today I'd like to talk about the Nakshenach disaster and rescue to mark the 70th anniversary of that unforgettable event in Yukumnuk's history. Nakshenach Castle Colliery was sunk in 1939 by Newcomnock Collieries Limited and it was one of the most modern mechanised pits in Scotland at the time. It remained under their control until 1947 when the coal industry was nationalised throughout Britain on the 1st of January of that year. By 1950 it was producing 5,000 tonnes per week and employed 600 people underground and 120 in the pit head. So if you look at a map of the area from not long after the disaster happened, at the centre you can see the fairly unremarkable Nakshinak Hill the name is Gaelic in origin, meaning Hill of the Fox. It sits between the Conal Burn in the west and the Afton Water in the east. If you look at the top left hand corner now, you can see KT, which is the site of a uh, Nakshinak Tower, which was home to the Dumbars of Nakshinak from the, the 15th century. That was later replaced by Nakshinak farm in this 18th century and the farm still stands there to this day. And then we can see Nakshinak Castle Colliery adjacent to the site of the tower it takes its name from. The red arrow shows the route of the number 5 heading where the coal was been worked and there uh, the symbol of the crater that was created after the inrush of liquid peat. And added to the map uh, is the site of uh, the much later memorial. Here we are and uh, last day August in 1950, heavy rain most of the week and you can see the workings of the heading number 5 heading towards the surface. It started off to 1 in 4 gradient and probably nearer 1 in 2 by, by the time it reached uh, here. There had been water running down number 5 heading, given some concern with some boulders coming uh, down as well. Uh, and the field above the 5 was surveyed. And they found there was only 38 feet between the heading roof and the surface. It was a wee bit soggy underfoot and appeared ordinary soil with nice green grass on it. Forward now to Thursday the 7th of September 1950. The heavy rain in Newcomnock had continued and at 6.30 that evening there was a large fall at the face of the number 5 heading. Inspection of the field above revealed some subsidence and that area was fenced off. However, the nice green grass was concealing a hidden danger, for below it lay a lake of liquid peat or moss. Regrettably, although the map of the area held centrally indicated the presence of moss, the map held it Nakshinak did not. At half past seven, the lake unleashed a vortex of some 60,000 tonnes of liquid sludge down the heading at a great force, destroying equipment and machinery and anything that got in its way. A serial image taken the following day reveals the extent of the inrush and can only conjure up images of the disaster unfolding below. 
On the right hand side is a map of the workings of Nakshina Castle Colliery. Here you can see the number 5 heading with an image of the crater and the X marking the spot of the inrush of peat. Thirteen men were working in this area of the pit when the inrush occurred and the initial searches, hampered by the sludge, failed to locate them. Meanwhile, news of the scale of the inrush was communicated to the other 116 men working down the pit. Under the leadership of Overman Andrew Houston, they congregated at the West Main Station, where thankfully the telephone contact to the surface remained intact. Houston was able to explain that they were all trapped with no means of escape, and also sadly confirmed 13 men were missing. At the surface, it was recalled that in order to improve the drainage in Nakshinach, a new road was driven into the abandoned Bank No. 6 workings and progressed to within 24 feet of the nearest bank tunnel. A barricade of rock, earth and coal separated the two and a small borehole was drilled to drain off any water from the Nakshinach side. The plan was now to fashion an escape for the 116 men by means of a rescue hole at this point. News of the extent of the disaster was conveyed to the NCB officials and mine workers union and to the outside world. Nakshinak would be on the front pages of newspapers across the land and beyond. The mine rescue brigades, volunteers, local and fire, emergency services were all mobilised. A preliminary check of the bank number six workings was carried out. While Andrew Houston was instructed to have the barrier checked from the Nakshinak side and share the news with his men. The rescue plan illustrates the routes to the barricade. The green route shows the route taken by Houston and a party of his men via the Waterhead Duck to reach the barricade, while a blue route shows the rescue brigade entry into the bank number no. six workings as they prepared to encounter the deadly fire damp gas in the abandoned works. Powerful fans were taken in order to establish a main fresh air base and an advanced fresh air base. The photo on the right shows the rescue men entering bank number no. 6 and hutches with an electric fan in the front hutch. Now into early Friday morning and as expected bank number no. 6 was full of fire damp gas. By noon, 300 feet of the gas had been cleared. From 4 o'clock to 9 o'clock, a stupendous effort was made to install more powerful fans. However, worryingly, no real progress was made in clearing the gas. The photo shows an anxious crowd of, no doubt, family, friends and colleagues of the trapped and missing men at the entry to the bank workings. At 3pm, Houston and his men were given clearance to start digging a hole through the barricade, taking turns in small teams. At 10.45pm that evening, rescuers and miners hove through the barricade together. The miners were then instructed to begin widening the hole with caution. Fire damp in the bank side remained a big problem. There were also concerns that the airflow may change direction, with fire damp flowing from Bank to Nakshara. The photo shows rescue worker Simon Grant of the Kirkconnell rescue team being stretched out of the Bank No. 6 in the early hours of Saturday the 9th of September. No doubt increasing the anxiety levels of those waiting at the pit to head for their loved ones. There was good news on the Saturday morning with the delivery of food and drink delivered to the trapped men. But this soon changed when the news that fire damp had been detected in the Waterhead Duck and the Nakshinak side. Morale was then boosted when local man Dave Park, now Deputy Labour Director in the NCB Scotland, joined the trapped men and would remain with them throughout. These images from the bank, number six bit head, Show family, friends and colleagues waiting anxiously for news, any news, of the trapped and missing men. The fire damp in bank number no. 6 was stubbornly not for shifting and time was not on the side of the trapped miners. 
Dave Park had called for a change of plan in terms of the breathing apparatus that would be used to escort out the miners, promoting the use of the less cumbersome salvage equipment, although it had not been approved for use underground. His demands were met and a call went across the line from fire stations in particular to send this type of equipment to Nakshina. The sense of urgency intensified as gas was now detected near to the West Main telephone station. Further concern when at 12.45 on the Saturday afternoon one of the younger miners had taken a turn for the worse and required to be stretchered out. An act of bravery with the rescue teams which took two hours to complete. At 5pm on Saturday the 19th of September the plan was now finalised, with chains of rescue brigade men set up in both the bank and the Chinook side. The first act was to forward the salvage equipment to the trap men. Andrew Houston then established a rota for the 116 men to be taken out in groups of three via the chains of the rescue workers. Houston's rota has survived and is shown here. At 5.20 in the afternoon of Saturday 9th of September 1950, almost two days since the inrush at the number five heading, the evacuation of 116 trap miners began. And at 6.07pm the first group were greeted with great cheers at the pit head of the bank number six. Some seven hours later and five minutes into Sunday morning, the last of the 116 men emerged from the darkness into the light. Soon after, Dave Park joined them. This had been a remarkable rescue. 116 lives saved that once were feared to be lost. 20 rescue brigades involved, six brigades constantly in the danger zone at one time, and the Coke Bridge rescue team remained in the Nakshinak side throughout the evacuation. Andrew Houston was still in demand and returned to the scene of the inrush to indicate where the 13 missing men had been working. It became clear that any survivors could not be reached via the route through the bank number six workings. Exploring parties then accessed the number five heading, but the crater was still in a very dangerous state. On Monday 11th of September, any hopes of reaching the missing men alive were given up. Those missing men were John D.L., James Houston, Thomas Houston, William Howitt, William Lee, James Love, William McFarlane, John McClatchy, Samuel Rowan, John Smith, Daniel Strachan, John Taylor and John White. The survivors were taken to Balakmyo Hospital near Mochlin for checkovers and soon released home. And a week later many of them enjoyed a trip to Butlins at air. Tragically, there had been other loss of life during the Nakshinak disaster. Hugh Blackwood volunteered to help dig ditches to divert the water away from the crater. After a hard day's work, he headed for his home in nearby Arthur Road, but sadly collapsed and died, and now lies in the Arthur Cemetery. Members of the Salvation Army had been in attendance from the first news of the disaster. These included five Salvationists from Salkuts who travelled back and forth each day. Tragically, on returning home on the Sunday morning, their car was involved in a crash and driver Arthur Morris was killed at the scene while his fiancée Iris Wiley later died in the hospital of her injuries. They lie together in Addressen Cemetery. A service of divine worship was held at Martyr's Kirk in Yukonnak on Sunday the 17th of September 1950. 
The officiating ministers were the Right Reverend Hugh Watt, moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland, the Reverend Hardy, Secretary of the Scottish Baptist Union, and the Reverend Stuart, moderator of the Presbyterian. Of course, our local ministers were there, the Reverend Lowry from the Arthur Memorial, the Reverend Morgan from the Baptist Kirk, the Reverend Buchanan from the Bank Kirk, and the Reverend Wall from the Martyrs Kirk. The Reverend Moore proceeded throughout the service. <laughs> Bodies of the 13 Akshinak missing men were recovered the following year, over a period from January to July 1951, and buried at the Afton Cemetery, overlooking the scene of the disaster in the Nakshinak pit bin. Volunteers from the Newcomnock Community Council, with support from local sponsors, established the Nakshinak Commemorative Cairn, a short distance from the site of the Nakshinak Crater. Two cairns sit within the paved enclosure. The number 13 formed by 13 red flagstones surrounded by 116 yellow flagstones. An annual Nakshinak Memorial Service has been held here for a number of years now. Thank you for letting me be part of Tea in the Hall again. I really appreciate it. The Nishinak Disaster and Rescue remains a huge part of our coal mining heritage and you come next history. We now come to our time of remembrance and I invite you online to join in it if you wish. In a few moments we'll hear the names of the 13 men and then we'll have a minute's silence in remembrance, followed by the blessing. But we begin our time of remembrance with a poem that's called The Thirteen Men. The Thirteen Men, their names we ken, and what about they stayed? Some were neighbours, most were friends, all were brothers in a miner's kind of way. The youngest ones were in their twenties, the oldest sixty-one. The rest of them that were lost that day were somewhere in a tween. They all had families, some wives, some wains, and that bigger family too. Steep streets do wide through on you come, Nick reaching up to the present day. For there's no money even new that wouldn't ken, at least one or the thirteen men. Their names are on a wheel of lists, forms, reports, investigations, on plaques, memorials, and of course read out at each commemoration. We'll not forget them, nor will their names by their God forgotten be. For each of them, like each of us, is the apple of his ee. And for each of them, and for each o oh, us, Jesus died on that old rugged cross. And I can with mine and all this day, or oh, the rescued, the 116. We honour them and their rescuers and shudder at what might have been. But this moment, this milestone, three score year and ten, let's remember the lives of these 13 men. John Dale, James Houston, Thomas Houston, William Howitt, William Lee, James Love, John Taylor, William McFarlane, John McClatchy, Samuel Rowan, John Smith, Daniel Strachan, 
John White. Lakshinik's 13 men, let us remember them. Amen. Now go in peace and by faith make God's story part of the story of your life. And may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you now and stay with you forever. Amen. Amen.